Kia ora guys and welcome back to the Black Jersey. My name's Max, I'm the host over here at this channel and a massive thank you as per normal as I say at every video to my patrons. The World Cup, wow, we've had a week to let it finish, digest it all, allow the dust to settle and simply put, I think this is probably one of the greatest Rugby World Cups of all time. A lot of online discourse is bashing the ref, abusing players, abusing coaches, blah blah blah, whereas obviously you guys who watch me regularly know I'm just a normal dude who is like, right, this is why something was good, this is why it was bad, and here's my opinion as a result of analysis I've performed for you. Well guys, <laughs> I think the English, Welsh, Kiwi and Aussie fans who are saying rugby is dying, they're going to get a heck of a shock. Because simply put, well, Eden Park, Sky Stadium, the like, they can't sell out for an All Blacks test. You're going to get a rude awakening when I show you these stats demonstrating the growth of the 2023 Rugby World Cup. I'm also going to go over some key talking points about how every nation kind of got a moment and a few records broken to just show that rugby is well and truly alive. Let's get into this. So to start off with the World Rugby Media Zone, this has been the best attended Rugby World Cup ever, with more than 4 million cumulative attendance nationwide across France, across 9 stadia, so that's over 2.4 million people, and 10 rugby villages, 1.6 million. Even though people aren't managing to get tickets to games, they're still going to all these villages, these party zones, having a few drinks with their friends, socializing, meeting new people, potentially meeting, you know, future husbands, future wives. Awesome stuff. And the average match attendance. Wowzers. More than 50,000 people. Keep in mind the All Blacks versus Ireland's test and All Blacks versus Australia test, the last two times that we played at Eden Park, they were a crowd size of less than this. The 2022 Rugby World Cup final for the England women and the Black Ferns, that was less than this. And that was a sold out Eden Park. This is an absolutely huge average attendance. We also see that this is the most spoken about rugby event ever, with 3.1 billion impressions on digital and social media. And imagine how much more that could have grown if World Rugby was actually allowing content creators to comply with fair use rather than just saying, no, 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 fair use doesn't exist. Imagine how much bigger it could have been, even though there was a bit of a uh, difficulty for creators and getting footage. Like, that's crazy. There's also the fact that, a, in their own words, there's a global broadcast audience of over 800 million and more than a million news media mentions, so that's another really good thing. Even if the whole Australian side of the cycle won't be as good, the Romanian won't be as good, there's the whole thing that a nation also fell in love with rugby with a cumulative domestic audience of over 230 million on um, TF1, M6 and France television. That's huge. And last I checked, I think France had a population of about 60 or so million. So that's a whole bunch of people from France watching multiple games over and over and over and cheering on their home team. That's huge. There's also the factor of a, um, a fantastic 2023, Team 2023, made up of 4,400 volunteers to welcome the um, over half a million international fans. Like, see, that's a pretty decent amount of volunteers. Like, imagine all the extra people who are staff members doing paid work. A lot of people are putting a lot of work into this event because, simply put, they've got enough of a profit to have so much more going. There's also the fact that the whole tournament, this showed the best of rugby with 325 tries across 48 matches. This means the average tries scored was 6.77 or so, and that was up from 2019 that was 6.33. So that's a lot of huge, huge growth factors for World Rugby and the Rugby World Cup. So no, rugby's not dying. And imagine, considering this growth, how much bigger it could get. Think of, you know, Australia 2027, where there's going to be six pools and 24 teams. I'm now going to go over the pool stage to kind of just discuss the fact that every single nation, apart from, say, the Italians and the Romanians, kind of had a really nice moment. For example, this was the All Blacks' first pool stage loss in Pool A, with France topping the pool, winning by 27-13. to 13. Again, that was a really tough loss to take, but a huge moment for the French, opening night to their home crowd, getting such a victory. There's also the factor of Uruguay getting fourth place in this pool, um, and Uruguay also leading against Italy at halftime. 
huge moment for the Uruguayans, but also very nice for Italy to fend off and get the comeback. So even though Italy will kind of be going back home with their tails between their legs, that's also really good for them. There's a few notable Pool B performances as well. That was well and truly the pool of death with poor Scotland getting screwed over. Ireland versus South Africa though, man. One of the greatest pool stage matches of all time. 13 to 8 for the Irish with Ian Henderson getting that turnover at South Africa's last minute mall. Tonga's scrum as well. Even though Tonga will be pretty disappointed to finish fourth in the pool, they had a very nice 45 to 24 win over Romania, and their scrum was a real standout and really helped out the fact that their lineout wasn't too good over the competition as well. Darcy Graham as well stood out for Scotland, getting four tries over Romania in one of the best performances we have ever seen, even better than Damian Peno against Namibia and that's saying something. Um, even though Romania really, really did not play well, you know, this is their first World Cup attendance since 2015. They missed 2019, so at least they got to be there, you know. There's also Pool C. Wow. <laughs> Seriously, like, that was an incredible pool. I know we all got sick of Fiji, Wales, Georgia, Australia, all being in the same pool over and over and over, but you know what? This time it led to really good contests, especially with Australia under Dave Rennie falling off and Eddie Jones not really doing anything to get them to improve. Fiji also made the first quarter finals for the first time since 2007, thanks to um, dropping that ball at the end of the game against Wales. They also beat Australia for the first time since 1954. My grandmother was three years old when that last happened, and uh, my grandmother on my paternal side, she would have been like seven years old or so. So both of my grandparents, who are still alive were little, little kids when that happened. And Fiji won 22 to 15. That was their last just ever win over the Wallabies as well. Wales as well, first place. Huge, huge, huge for Wales getting this done in Pool C, though I made a mistake in the graphic. Wales had been completely written off. There were some people in the media saying they were going to lose to Portugal. I decided, you know what, I'm going to pay particular attention to Wales and to England ahead of this World Cup, as you guys know, and though there wasn't a lot of evidence to suggest Wales were on the up, it was there, and I was one of the few people saying Wales had a chance, they managed to do it, they topped the pool. Portugal as well, good on them. They got to a first World Cup since 2007, and they also got their first ever win in a World Cup with Fiji being on both the receiving and the negative end of historic results. Portugal getting the win by 24 to 23, thanks to Samuel Marquez getting the goal. Man oh man, Paul D though, a bit of an annoying pull to watch, a bit of a grind, but still some nice things to happen because England, similarly to Wales, had been written off, but managed to top the pull. They only beat Samoa by 18 to 17 though, Samoa really getting a nice moment, Lima Sipawanga man of the match, even though Samoa ended up losing. Argentina as well, they made the quarterfinals for the first time since 2015, as they beat Japan by 39 to 27 there, sorry. Argentina, yeah, a bit inconsistent, you guys know my thoughts on them, but at least they turned up when it mattered. At least they progressed further than they were starting to look like the direction they were heading towards. And also, the first World Cup match between two South American sides, thanks to Chile getting to the first World Cup in their history, they weren't competitive at all. Um, a lot of their type 5 forwards weren't very good, but it was really nice to finally see how they played rugby, see their take on it, and I enjoyed watching them. They gave it a good go. They've got nothing to be ashamed about. It was the first time in their history. And there's also some nice takeaways from the playoffs. I truly believe this sets a quarterfinals. Well, they were the most entertaining in history. Though my prediction of the quarterfinal didn't exactly go as smoothly, well, simply put, it was crazy. Because Wales was still within a winning margin up until the 76th minute with Nicolas Sanchez getting the intercept off Sam Costello, extending the scoreline out of the Welsh reach for Argentina. It was also a bit of a talking point with Jaco Paper, the referee, coming off injured. You know, you don't see referee replacements very, very often, so that was a huge talking point as well. Boy, oh boy, this one was good as well. The All Blacks beat Ireland by 28-24 in a rematch of the 2022 series. Ireland defeated us at home. I was absolutely, you know, sick of seeing the All Blacks not learn lessons from, say, 2016's loss to Ireland Chicago. Well, it finally all happened. They learned from the problems. And in the rematch of the 2019 quarterfinal, they got sweet revenge despite two yellow cards. And, well, it sets the talking point again. Are Ireland cursed? 
because I was not celebrating that whole game. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. I was like, no, 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 no. They're still rugby to play. They could still win, but Ireland choked. And there was awesome for the All Blacks. There was also a nice uh, late comeback attempt by Fiji against the English, having beaten them earlier this year. But Owen Farrell, man, just putting us on the edge of our seats again, putting the score on out of reach with a drop goal and a penalty goal, all tied up with 10 minutes to go up until the 72nd minute, sorry, with the drop goal. Like, come on, that's crazy. England versus Fiji really giving us some drama. And man, oh man, France, South Africa. One of the greatest World Cup games we've ever seen again. Another one of those great games, much like Fiji-Wales, much like Fiji-Portugal. But South Africa reverting to the 5-3 split, it really made the uh, selection of Yoram Maui Fana stick out as pretty dodgy, and Sufi Makalu as well, the extra forward covering the back line, able to cover centre and wing just like Maui Fana, really made France pay for not picking Melvin Jaminet to come off the bench, and wow, France really could have won. They bullied South Africa at the breakdown, but simply put, they choked. And South Africa were through. And the finals, man, the All Blacks qualified for the World Cup final for the fifth time in history. Huge with Will Jordan getting a hat trick to get eight tries at the World Cup, equaling a record for the men's tournament by Brian Habana, Julian Savia, and Jonah Lomu. And the draw side comparisons really, you know, that shows us that while the quarterfinals are really good at months again, got people talking on social media, which is great for the game. You know, the draw being a bit dodgy, getting the All Blacks a rest. Opens conversations. And again, England, South Africa, another one point win for South Africa. England were leading by 12 to 6 at half time, and they got their first ever bronze medal, however, because South Africa managed to come back. It gave us the talking point of South Africa's experienced players, and as well as Oxen Shears scrummaging. And though I didn't watch the bronze final, I chose not to. The final, man, huge, huge, huge. A lot of people had been wanting a rematch of 1995 for a long time because simply put the All Blacks and the Springboks have the most competitive rivalry in the Southern Hemisphere and I've got to argue probably the biggest in rugby unless the Scots want to say it's England versus Scotland. South Africa, the only team with a winning percentage over them are the All Blacks. They're the only teams to have more wins over South Africa than South Africa have over them. So, you know, there was a huge final. And now we're going to look at all these records that got broken. South Africa became the first team to win a men's World Cup four times. They also became the second ever men's team to win back-to-back -back World Cups. Sorry about the mistake I made in the graphic. Warren Gatlin as well breaking a record, becoming the first head coach to coach at five World Cups. Sam Whitelock, man, cannot say it enough either. The greatest player of all time. The fourth man to reach three World Cup semifinals and three finals and the most capped All Black of all time with 153 test matches. The greatest player to ever play, also becoming the most capped player in World Cup history, with 25 total appearances at the tournament in his playing career across four World Cups. Massive stuff. Johnny Sexton and Owen Farrell as well, as we can see, they broke their national records for the highest ever point scorers. Andre Pollard, though, he got to break the sweetest record of them all. He didn't miss a single goal at this World Cup, and with 34 points, he's become the top point scorer in World Cup final history. Sia Khaleesi, too, he's now got a record of 53 test matches as the Springboks captain. He reached 50 during this World Cup. Um, Georgia and Portugal, they also welcomed the highest try scorers in their history, with um, Akaki Tabutatza getting his 30th test try, and Rodrigo Marta also getting his 30th for Portugal, getting it at the end of that ma match Sorry, there against Fiji. Just 23 years old for him and just 26 years old for Tabutatza. Those guys are going to get massive, massive tallies by the end of their career. Like, come on. And Marcos Kramer too, huge. Breaking the record for most tackles in a tournament. Peter Steph Dutoy, though, one-upping him to break the most tackles for a single match also doing so in the final, breaking the 18 tackles that Richie McCaw made in the 2011 final. Peter Steph Dutoy, man, absolute killer man of the match performance, huge for him. Wales as well, 252 tackles against Fiji, while the All Blacks became the first team in history to win 50 matches at a World Cup. Huge records for the All Blacks and Wales for those two over there, really nice team efforts over time. Wayne Barnes as well, congratulations to him. He did not deserve all the abuse he copped. He became the first referee to officiate at five World Cups. While a lot of the people speaking of officiating were complaining about cards, blah, 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 it wasn't a crazy card fest like a lot of people were asking for. This was just a record equaling of red cards and they were all very consistent, giving out for very similar things, so that's all good. Though it was the first men's final with a red card, 
the discipline wasn't as bad as you'd think. This is probably one of the Rugby World Cups with some of the best outright discipline I've seen. There were only nine sightings the least in recorded history, so man. Huge victories in the pool stages, intense quarterfinals, an intense final, an intense semi, heaps of records broken, and huge growth stats. Rugby is not dying. New Zealand is just simply having a bit of tug of war with other codes because the Foster era has enabled other sports in New Zealand to have a golden age. Australia, yeah, you can probably make that case, but Wales are on the up. And England, potentially, based on what happens with the Premiership, they're coming back up as well. South Africa too, they've got a very, very high population. I think they've got a population of 60 million as well. So think of all the new rugby players we're going to get out of that. Rugby is well and truly on the way up, and it's been absolutely amazing to cover this all. Leave your comments down below as well, and make sure to subscribe to me and like this channel if you enjoyed it. Like the video too, that would be awesome, because man oh man, I love rugby. I'm going to keep talking about it for as long as I can. It's the best sport in the world. It's the game played in heaven, and it is not dying. It is on the up. I truly believe the 2023 Rugby World Cup is the greatest World Cup of all time, and I'll catch you guys later. Cheers for watching from Max.